questions. Um, I also am super excited to um, be in this session and um, I'm not in a very enviable spot. I'm in between um, two of the luminaries of fungal ecology <laughs> these days between Peter and Kabir. So I'll do my best with my time to um, share with you some of my enthusiasm um, about endophytes uh, and um, why I think they're a great fit for a session that's centering on uh, interactions and communities. Um, I am coming to you from uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, my living room to be specific, and um, in doing so, I'm coming from the traditional lands of the Tahanaw and the Pascoyaki peoples um, here in Arizona. So um, what I'd like to do today is actually start um, with uh, thinking about the phyloplane, right? So the phyloplane, um, that is the leaf surface that we see all around us, um, is often acknowledged as the largest biotic habitat for microbes uh, on the planet. Um, these leaf surfaces are what we see when we walk into a forest like this tropical forest. However, if we were to do a deep dive into any of the leaves around us, we would see an immense internal surface area that is the surface of each of these cells and the spaces between them that together represents an area far larger than the phyloplane itself. That is an area that is uh, encompassed by a tremendous number of microbes, including fungal endophytes. This is a, a reality that we see when we dive into a seed as well. Again, many uh, cell surfaces that together create what we refer to as the endosphere or the apoplast. And it's in this environment that we find uh, the vast majority of fungal endophytes in a habitat that is orders of magnitude larger than what we can see when we walk into a forest and look only at leaf surfaces. The study of endophytes has a really nice history going back well over 100 years um, with a special focus early on on grass associated endophytes and a widespread appreciation that when you take a healthy piece of a leaf and you surface sterilize it and you place it onto a growth medium, out will grow an endophyte in many cases. And so for a long time, um, endophytes in most plants outside of the grass system where they sicken herbivores and have other impactful um, uh, ways to interact with humanity. The endophytes that we see in most other plants um, haven't gotten a lot of attention, um, but I think they're pretty charismatic. Um, this is a photo of a few of the endophytes that I studied back in my dissertation days. And as someone coming to mycology with an appreciation for organismal biology and a desire to learn about these things, um, they spoke to me and I hope that you see their beauty um, as I do. So what do we know right now about fungal endophytes? Um, well, first of all, we know that um, in general, endophytes are phylogenetically diverse. The vast majority are filamentous ascomycota, and we see them uh, occurring frequently, um, especially in the Sardariomycetes and Dothidiomycetes. Um, also, we're appreciating them ever more in the Leotiomycetes, not only in certain conifers in the Pinaceae, but in, for example, high montane habitats in the tropics. Eurotiomycetes, um, which we encounter in a variety of settings, including, for example, um, tropical soils where they infect seeds uh, or in uh, aquatic habitats. Um, and pizizomycetes, which are holding some really interesting surprises, um, a greater prevalence of endophytism perhaps than was previously recognized. Um, because these are uh, a common feature across these classes that together comprise the vast majority of the known diversity of ascomycota outside the lichen-forming fungi, um, we consider them to be uh, quite um, foundational symbionts when it comes to plants. Um, if we go back to the origins of the Pizizomycotina, um, recent estimates place that on the order of 500 to 600 million years ago such that the capacity to make a living, living in close association with a photosynthetic partner, likely preceded the great diversification of land plants. Um, today, we know that endophytes are likely hyperdiverse, kind of a, an unusual term, but one that we can um, maybe uh, define as representing uh, hundreds of thousands of species. And we know that they're underrepresented in culture collections, um, in part because of their lifestyle of simply living inside healthy tissue and not necessarily fruiting during the uh, time in which that tissue is alive and looking good. Um, through the past 20 years, I've been very fortunate to work with a wonderful uh, group of collaborators, including Francois Lizzoni, Jenna Uren, Chuzo Oita, um, and our Panama team, especially Jim Dowling, um, Carolina Sarmiento, and Camila Salamea. 
as well as many others to collect on the fights at a nearly global scale. Um, basically going into environments and asking uh, in the common plants, lichens, uh, in those leaves and in the seeds that we find, what are the fungi that are present? Um, and how can we start to understand something about how their communities are assembled and what they do? Um, one of the nice things is that with more than 200,000 strains now um, at the University of Arizona, uh, the vast majority of which are barcoded for ITS partial SU, um, we're able to start the long process of describing those that are gracious enough to fruit and culture. That's a lovely subset of beautiful fungi, um, and it's been a real pleasure to be exploring them. For example, these beautiful species of Coniokita. Okay, so let's go back then to the endosphere or the apoplast. So this area inside um, leaves and seeds and other structures is really interesting from an ecological perspective because it represents a continuum with the outside environment. We see this in mature leaves of adult trees and we see it even in the earliest stages of plant establishment. Here we have an electron micrograph. Um, this was an image taken by Yuling Huang who was a graduate student with me. And what we see is a spore that is germinated on a leaf surface. It's sent out a hypha, and that hypha is entering into the leaf through the stomatal opening. Um, and so in this situation, with the vast majority of fungal endophytes having some element of horizontal transmission, we know that the spores have to be dispersed, the uh, spores have to survive, they have to germinate successfully, and then uh, the foraging hypha needs to find its way um, into the plant tissue. Now, once inside, in the vast majority of plants, um, we can see the um, hyphae proliferating between cells. Um, so this is another image from Yuling's work. This is coming from Juniper. And um, what you can see are the fungal hyphae growing between cells here. Okay? So they are truly in this apoplastic space. And that's not unique, of course, to plant leaves. We see that uh, here. This is, uh, again, an electron micrograph. In this case of a tropical seed, this was taken by Camilo Salamea, and the seed has been buried in tropical forest soil for a period of time and brought back out. And you can see the covering of fungal hyphae adhering closely to that seed. And as the seed ages or is acted upon by forces like temperature and water, you get the rupture of the colossal plug here at the base of the seed um, and the entry then of fungal hyphae. Okay. So in those early stages, then we have that continuum from, in this case, growing from soil into seeds um, and proliferating uh, inside that seed tissue. Now, a similar situation occurs with lichen phalli. Um, and in this case, endophyte-like fungi associate preferentially with photobiont cells. So here we're looking at a cross-section of a lichen phallus with our photobiont. And if we micro, micro dissect that photobiont layer out, we get a large number of fungi, um, very similar phylogenetically and functionally to fungal endophytes of plants. And um, Jana Yuren did some really nice uh, work on this that helped us understand that even in the same habitat, the endophytes that are occurring inside lichens can be quite distinct from those occurring in angiosperms, in conifers or ferns, and actually have a very high community similarity to those occurring in non-vascular plants like mosses. And we can see this similarity happening even in complex environments like this, where we have a lichen growing with a variety of mosses uh, and with local angiosperms, we still get this strong difference. So there's something about growing in a non-vascular host um, that unites those groups of fungi. So um, another interesting element that's come out of surveys of endophytes is that endophytes appear to be distinct from other fungal communities and they differ in composition among biomes. So this is exciting because as we move around the world, we can find more and more endophyte species. Um, but it's also interesting to think about the implications for essentially localized coevolutionary processes. Um, this has been studied uh, perhaps most thoroughly by uh, the UREN lab um, and with uh, the work that I'd like to reference coming out in 2019, focusing on endophytes of boreal systems. And in that study, one aspect of what the group did was to compare sequence data from uh, culture-free and culture-based surveys of endophytes all around the boreal forest belt and uh, compared the degree to which those OTUs were represented also in soil fungal data sets using the Tetersu et al. 2014 data set. Um, and the upshot is only about 1.5% of the fungi uh, that were present in these data sets were in common. 
Um, and that was 10 times fewer than expected by chance alone. So the take home is that by the time we're looking at endophytes that are present in above ground tissues of plants, they're representing quite a different community than one might find with similar methods in surveying only soil. Okay? One way to think about that is that they're potentially enriched for by the conditions within plants. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Another thing that um, Jana and the team did was to compare sequence data with similar endophyte surveys that were done um, in the temperate zone and other biomes. And in that work, um, Jana pointed out that about 90% of the cultured endophytes from the boreal system were uniquely boreal compared to known databases, as were about 97% that were observed by culture-free methods. So this suggests that there is a strong turnover as one moves from major biome to major biome, um, and that we might expect a collection of relatively distinct boreal endophytes, temperate endophytes, and so on. Um, it's interesting that as we move, for example, from the temperate zone to the tropics, we see similar disparities in those communities. Um, and then finally, um, we see even if we focus on uh, a single genus of hosts that is widespread, we see high turnover among biomes, even in that one case. So not looking at a global perspective, but only at hosts uh, that represent the same genus. And we can see that illustrated here. This is information for um, endophytes from uh, Cladonia. And we can see temperate forests uh, being quite separate from boreal forest and uh, Arctic um, endophytes in the tundra. So um, this sort of pattern then uh, is exciting. Um, it suggests a tremendous number of endophytes out there. Um, but when we say that endophytes are unique, sometimes we want to put a little asterisk there. Um, and just one example um, came out of the beautiful work um, led by some members in the Zoom room, um, looking at uh, morels uh, and identifying new morel species in North America, um, including a Mortella caibensis, um, which is an interesting one that was detected as a foliar endophyte um, through database uh, information uh, and obviously um, lives its full morel life um, outside the endophytic uh, arrangement. So this suggests some interesting biology uh, and the potential for plant tissue, lichen tissue, to basically be a reservoir of hidden diversity that connects and informs other fungal ecology questions. Okay. So um, for a long time, um, early on, especially in plant pathology, there was the idea that the apoplast, the space on the surface and between cells and plant tissue, um, wasn't that exciting. It was mostly just carbon leakage, and that's about all. But now we know that the apoplast of most plants contains really diverse and rich nutrients, as well as uh, diverse and dynamic interactions uh, that we know are influenced by fungal plant communication. Um, so I've just grabbed a cartoon here um, that illustrates an example where we have an endophyte in this case coming in through a stomatal pore and growing between cells like we saw in the photos at the start. And the accumulation of evidence is that uh, in this apoplastic space, um, endophytes can modulate plant hormone production and signaling. They can secrete um, cell wall degrading enzymes and trigger basal immunity. They can release effectors or not, either invoking or avoiding plant responses. They can trigger jasmonic acid or salicylic acid pathways, which influence plant interactions with other organisms. In some cases, they can induce lignification or callus deposition, thickening the plant cell walls, making the plant more robust. Um, and then finally, they can produce secondary metabolites with diverse impacts. So I wanted to take a moment and think um, about those secondary metabolites. Uh, and uh, just highlight some of the metabolic diversity that one can find associated even with a single strain of a relatively uh, well-studied genus like Xyleria. Um, so um, this work is highlighting some of the sesquiterpenes that are associated with this one strain of Xyleria when it's grown on a single medium under controlled lab conditions, leaving aside um, how the expression of these and other metabolites might be influenced by the substrates present in a given host or environmental conditions. So what's interesting is that when we start to look at secondary metabolite production, we can see that not only the production, but also the impact varies at a landscape scale. So for this, I'll just take us on a short trip to the beautiful cloud forests of Central America. And here, um, I wanted to highlight the work of Sarah Higginbotham, who looked at phylogenetically paired endophytes that one could find uh, occurring in cloud forest, um, and occurring in lowland humid forest. These were phylogenetically paired to the point of being in the same genera, um, sometimes even the same species occurring at low elevations and high elevations. 
And what's interesting is that in vitro, when the secondary metabolite activity of these fungi was evaluated, what Sarah found was that the uh, percent inhibition, that is the activity of secondary metabolites with a cytotoxic effect, was much higher for the endophytes from cloud forests and much lower for endophytes from the lowland human forest. And this was a, a bit of a surprise. We actually went in thinking that um, those lowland forests would be uh, where we see the majority of the most potent secondary metabolites. But as we thought about it, we realized that the ever wet, often clouded conditions with high diversity of tropical highland or cloud forests actually creates an environment of very high degree of competition among co-occurring endophytes. Um, they uh, flourish with relatively uh, moist conditions, um, places with relatively thick long-lived leaves and so on. So we think that what we're seeing is actually an ecological pattern translating to what we can observe in vitro. So um, with that in mind, we've just talked about how endophytes may be signaling to their host plants um, and interacting with them. Um, we can see signatures of that with the secondary metabolites. But what's interesting is that even though the interactions between plants and endophytes are happening in this internal space, they can have a subtle to very visible context dependent um, and uh, interesting phenotypes. So one new one that we're excited about is basically the ability to remote sense endophytes in leaves. So I mentioned that some endophytes will induce lignification. This creates a sufficiently different signature of leaf structure that we can detect it by measuring leaf reflectance. So in certain wavelengths, we can see distinctive signatures of endophytes being present in a leaf. We also know that um, endophytes can be negative for their hosts in some cases. So where I work uh, in the tropics is a seasonally dry forest. Um, it has a prolonged drought uh, during the dry season and plants are water stressed. An interesting aspect of endophytes in that environment um, is that they can increase minimum leaf conductance. That is the amount of water that is lost from a leaf when the stomata are maximally closed. So it raises an interesting question of um, potential costs and benefits being balanced in a variety of environments. And in the lowland forest where we work, um, this detriment um, we think is broadly balanced by the ability of endophytes to protect their host plants against disease. Um, and so um, this is uh, an example from Theobroma cacao. Um, this was a project led by Luis Mejia um, with Alan Harry at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And because endophytes are horizontally transmitted, we can grow seedlings under controlled conditions and then introduce endophytes, in this case, multiple endophyte species to reconstitute what a natural community would look like. We then can introduce the pathogen, in this case, Phytophthora. What we see are that leaves that have only the pathogen have vastly more leaf damage than leaves that have endophytes present. What we can't see is that actually the leaves with endophytes were twice as likely to survive even before they got to this point. So we see this localized benefit um, often on a per leaf basis, not a fully systemic basis. And it raises some neat questions about what those interactions might be like inside leaves and how that can help us understand the roles of community assembly. Um, one last thing that we'll note um, is that sometimes uh, we can capture endophytes from leaves and apply them to other plant tissues and see uh, beneficial impacts. And that's what we're seeing here, a case where a foliar endophyte has been applied to seeds of wheat um, in the top, and they've all germinated and they're growing. Um, they don't uh, necessarily look like field grown because they've been in a petri dish, but they are happy um, in comparison with the endophyte untreated seeds down at the bottom. Um, so this opens up on the one hand, the exciting possibility of translatable phenotypic modulation. That is you capture endophytes from one tissue or one plant, you apply them to another plant and you get a phenotype that may be useful for humans. Um, and that has prompted some of our recent investigation looking at endophytes of wild relatives of crop plants. Um, so this is a solanum um, growing in this lush field. This is um, here in Arizona. This is agriculture in Arizona, lots of dry space with nutrient poor soil. Um, here we have this wild relative of crop plants flourishing. The question is what endophytes does it have um, and how do those contribute? So that's an area of inquiry that we're pretty excited about um, doing that kind of translational work. Um, however, uh, there are some challenges. Um, and that is that we know that not all plants will accept the same given endophyte um, and we see that in part um, through uh, two different lenses. So the first lens is that the interactions that we observe um, can be driven by 
additional hidden components of these symbionts. Uh, and that is the endohyphal bacteria that live inside the endophytes themselves. So here, um, this is an image by Joe Spreaker. We're looking at the outside of a fungal hypha now for our endophyte. And in a moment, we'll zoom in. Um, and on the inside, we can see those beautiful bacteria fluorescing. So these are endohyphal bacteria that are important um, in a variety of ways. Uh, when we've done removal experiments, we've been able to see that they enhance growth of individual endophytes on the majority of carbon substrates that we look at. And this includes sugars that are found in seed coats, regulators of stomatal closure, and drivers of seed germination and plant growth. So this is just to remind me um, to say that we can see it um, in vitro, and we can see it with seed viability here with tetrazoleum stain. Um, and it's something that we're now exploring under field conditions. Um, we also know that there are some interesting additional impacts of these endohyphal bacteria. These data come from Michelle Hoffman's work back in the day. And what we're looking at is the production of indole 3 acetic acid, an important phytohormone, um, over time for the same strain of fungus that simply has its bacterium present or has had that bacterium removed. Now, we don't know a priori whether or not we're seeing differences in production um, or those are somewhat different. Um, we also know, though, that we see modulation of cellulase activity. We also see thermal tolerance. And so the presence of these additional microbes can influence uh, how a given fungus will exist uh, in the landscape. Um, and one area that this is especially exciting for me is I'm thinking about the saprotroph to endophyte uh, sort of continuum that we see uh, in Xylaria and related fungi. Um, so if it's the case that micro, microbe associations, which are facultative, um, they're very flexible, different fungi can pick up the same bacteria uh, in the ascomycota that we survey, and we'll hear more from Greg Benito's team a little bit later about other fungi. Um, this could play a really important role in defining host selectivity, um, along with the intrinsic effectors that are uh, part of the communication between particular plants and fungi. So as a result, it's not surprising that um, when we go out in the environment, we see communities of endophytes varying among hosts in most of the environments where we look. Um, this uh, figure uh, summarizes a lot of work that, again, led by Jana Yuren. And here you can see um, our surveys that occurred around the boreal forest belt in places ranging from Sweden to central Russia to eastern Russia to Alaska uh, and across uh, North America. Here you can see the different uh, lineages of hosts. And the take home message is that when we go into an environment and sample thoroughly, we will see distinctive endophyte communities associated with different hosts and different host lineages. When we're doing this kind of work, it's, it's observational, um, but we can capture this perhaps even more powerfully by moving from the boreal environment, like we see here, to the tropical environment, where we've set up experiments under the leadership of uh, Camilo Salamea and Carolina Sarmiento to look at what fungi are actually getting into seeds in such a um, important moment of seed dispersal and establishment that is the key to fitness um, for tropical trees. So to do this, what we've done um, is across BCI, we've had five common gardens. We've worked with 18 species of tropical trees. We have placed seeds into these little mesh bags and buried them for up to 36 months in these gardens. And what we see um, as the strong emergent pattern is captured by this sort of variant stock decomposition. In a common garden with distantly related pioneer trees, after about a year in forest soil, we see a strong signature of plant species. That is, the communities differ one plant species to the next, despite being in a common garden environment. And that explains much more of the variation in those fungal communities than does burial duration, garden location, or even whether the seed is viable or not. So that's for distantly related angiosperms. What happens if we look at closely related ones um, after 36 months in forest soil? Once again, a strong signature of plant species. So it tells us that there is some filtering that's occurring uh, to select or allow to flourish certain endophytes in certain hosts. Okay. So where I'll end up then is just stepping back a little bit and saying when we're looking within a site, we can often see that signature of uh, a host effect, variation in endophyte communities among hosts. If we go to a landscape scale, um, what we can start to do is integrate questions about, for example, how does environment or climate uh, fit into that picture? And here I just want to highlight some work that we did recently going across the Isthmus of Panama, um, working from the seasonally dry forests on the Pacific side 
to the everwet forests on the Caribbean side. And these data come from leaves of uh, angiosperms um, and our uh, Illumina data amplicon sequencing. And what we can see um, here is a strong signature of temperature seasonality um, on species richness of endophytes. That is in the least seasonal forests, okay, we see the highest richness. In the most seasonal forests, okay, um, we're able to detect a lower species richness. Um, and um, these uh, uh, results are sort of striking because our sites are less than 50 kilometers from each other, yet they have strongly different climate. Um, here, uh, we're looking at the community assembly. And in this case, with our non-metric multidimensional scaling, we can see the structure, again, among these different sites that are different only by a few kilometers with a strong signature of temperature seasonality, mean annual temperature, and mean annual precipitation. Um, and then finally, it's very interesting that host range also seems to vary as a function of temperature seasonality. Um, and we see the evidence here. So it suggests that um, with insights, we've got a powerful signature of uh, bacterial plant fungal interaction and fungal plant interaction. Um, at a broader scale, we see the role of climate. And at an even broader scale, moving out of the Isthmus of Panama, we can detect uh, in this case, with our map showing mean annual temperature, a strong signature of climate that we think underlies the original latitudinal gradient of endophyte diversity that was proposed back in 2007. Okay? So our stars here are showing some of the places we've been fortunate to survey over the years. So that raises the question, how do endophyte communities change over time as the climate is shifting? Um, and here, um, I just want to highlight some work that we're excited about. We're able to use Illumina approaches to look at endophyte communities in preserved plant specimens in herbaria. Um, and so this work originally was led by Barnabas Daru with uh, Don Feaster and PhD student Liz Bowman. Um, and now we're going to extend our sampling to the Arctic, basically looking at um, communities that are present in herbarium specimens collected over the past 100 to 200 years and going back and collecting afresh from the plants and lichens that occur in those areas today. So we hope that with uh, Transex we'll be able to look at climate change over time. So just to wrap up then, um, a lot of what I've talked about has been the ecological perspective, um, but one of the exciting frontiers is to start to integrate endophytes into the fungal tree of life. Um, and in doing so, we are uh, working on how to deal with lots of ITS sequences. Um, so I'm very grateful through NSF Dimensions and Genealogy of Life funding um, and the leadership of Ignacio Carbone um, and especially Francois Luzzoni for the development of um, some new tools that allow us to, with a degree of certainty, place endophytes into deep phylogenetic contexts. And what is the upshot of what we've seen so far? The first is that we see repeated processes of local diversification. So it's not just different sites have different endophytes, but there's been local diversification of endophyte mages in many of the sites where we work. We see that here in the Dothidiomycetes and in the Luciomycetes. Um, and so this means that a plant in a given area is influenced by who it is, the uh, bioclimatic uh, zone in which it occurs, and by the availability of the endophytes that are there. So it's this that then leads us to think about the global scale of um, interactions. And viewing that as a mosaic that is influenced by bacterial, fungal, fungal plant, uh, plant environment, um, and ecology evolution interactions. So that's where we are now in thinking about endophytes. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for your attention. Um, I want to thank Don and Elena for, for hosting this symposium. And again, Don, thank you for all that you've done um, for me and so many of us in mycology. I want to thank my many collaborators um, and students, um, and then finally, um, thank uh, the funding agencies that have supported the work on endophytes over the past couple of decades. So thank you so much, and I'll pass it off to Kabir.